All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, let's open the meeting of the um, Buffett Rockbury uh, Board of School Directors uh, at 633 on February 17th. Um, first order of business is public comment. Have any? Looks like none. Um, great, so we can move on to the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Do Do we need to take roll, Jim? No, we do need to take roll. I keep forgetting that. That is a new Zoom thing. Uh, Jill. Here. Emma. Here. Jerry. Here. Anakin. Here. Ryan. Here. Nia. Here. Andrew. Here. And Amanda. Here. Great. Um, thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, now do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second it. Uh, any discussion? Great. Uh, Jill? Aye. Um, Emma? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Nia? Aye. Andrew? Aye. And Amanda? Yeah. Um, great. Uh, so now we have um, Penny Chamberlain, uh, Scott Griggs, uh, Mike DeWeese, glad to see back, who not only helped Grant cut his teeth, but also helped us find Libby. Uh, so good to see you again. Uh, and is Cal Hapwood on as well? I see him on the agenda, but I'm not sure I see his square. It may be Clifton Long. He's our plumbing instructor. Mike oh, Clifton Long, well. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, to talk about the uh, Central Vermont uh, Career Center visioning uh, and governance. So I will turn it over to all of you and thank you. And if you need to share a screen or anything, I think Libby is, is Libby or Anna or the keeper of, of those tools. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry, I, I appreciate it. Sorry, I just wanted to apologize. I'm gonna have my camera off because my eyes hurt a lot because I've been in Zoom all day. So I wanted to yeah. let you know that I am paying um, attention, but I am I need to not be in the screen right now. No worries. That's perfectly understandable. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. All right. Well, I appreciate your time this evening uh, on your agenda. I you know you've got a, a full agenda here uh, this evening. The state law um, requires that if a career center is looking at a change in potential uh, governance that we need to present to each of our sending school district boards and review why we would like to go into a study to look at this and then um, have some Q&A time as well with you folks tonight and then actually take some action. And what I'd like to do is First, I want to know, have, have folks been able to review the documents that were sent ahead of time in the board packet? And most importantly is the packet that had a cover memo from me that had the board, uh, the CVCC governance report, and then a chart that followed that. There was a chart that went along with that. Yes. I won't Appreciate. necessarily do a screenshot if, if you're in good shape with that. Okay. Yeah, appreciate how thorough that was. Thank you. It's, it's been, uh, we've been doing this, looking at this for probably two years, two and a half years now. And we started to look at governance and our re-envisioning process at the same time. They were side by side and we were talking about the future of CVCC. Where were we going to go and, and what what would we want to um, include for programming to serve our, our region? 
And we were looking at all of these things. And then we realized that governance and re-envisioning or the future of CBCC can run side by side. They can, one can exist without the other or both exist together. So it's not something that has to happen. Governance does not have to, has to, have, have to happen in order to have a center in another location or to do a renovation to the current location. And nor would we have to have a new governance model or different, different governance model to be in a different location. So they do uh, run parallel to each other. Um, what we were looking at in the governance model, the main driver at, at this juncture in our, our investigation and why we're coming to all of you to have this conversation, we're headed into a budget vote in March and our region, all of you and our other five schools pay a tuition for students to attend the Central Vermont Career Center, but only Barry Town and Barry City voters have the authority to approve that budget, which then sets that tuition uh, because they are our governing board. That's the way it's set up in, in law at this time. And in order to move away from that and become our own governance structure, which would mean that all of our sending schools, all of our sending districts would have equal voice and vote on that budget and input, um, we would need to actually go through this formal process to request to um, move into a study. And then that study committee would uh, work toward the end of this school year with uh, Mike Deweese and I both working with them and looking at all aspects of governance and looking at the pros and cons of governance and looking at what does that mean and then coming up with a proposal that would come back to the boards before it moved on to uh, Secretary French and or the State Board of Education. So what we found as our, our biggest challenges with the Career Center is that the Regional Advisory Board is required in state statute as well for career centers. And that's a board that Libby serves on as a representative of the Montpelier School District, Montpelier Roxbury. And we have other superintendent and school board members who are members of that regional advisory board as well. And it is just an advisory board, only has advisory capacity and can make a recommendation uh, to the Barry Unified Union School District Governing Board. But that board does not have to accept that recommendation. So right now the voice is advisory um, and we would prefer to have that voice be equal for the Career Center across um, all our entire region. So in our process with boards at this time, we've met with and uh, received approval from the Barry Unified Union School District to move forward with a study. Union 32 District also, uh, Washington Central has approved that. Um, and it is just a study. It's just a chance to investigate what this means and what this could mean for our our center. So we're pre presenting to you folks tonight, and then we will be presenting to Cabot, Twinfield, and Harwood in March. So sometime around the end of March, early part of April, if three out of the five boards, I'd prefer five out of the five, but if three out of the five boards agreed to move forward uh, with the study committee, then we would start on that as soon as possible and uh, begin to dissect and, and look into these uh, issues or concerns and pros and cons of being our own governing board. The chart that's at the back of the packet that was sent in your board packet, which was attached to the governance report, governance white paper, is a chart um, where we got some feedback from the current, the three current technical centers that are their own governing board. And that's River Valley and Bennington and Middlebury. And it more, more so than not, it works out very well for them for the reasons that I was just describing. But there's also other reasons behind uh, having your own governing board. And that would be to have a board that's purely focused on technical education and tech ed rules and regs. What we find and what we know is that technical education regulation and pre-K-12 regulation and law tends to run side by side uh, within the state of Vermont. They all have their own set of books, if you will, from everything from finance to staffing to program development. Um, it's all slightly separate. It's slightly different uh, between the two different systems. The only time that those systems converge typically is within underneath that governing board. 
with Act 46 now uh, coming through to fruition for everyone, um, districts are larger. So now there is less time at that governing board level to uh, be providing more guidance and support for career and tech ed, because now they're a larger district, smaller board, and, and more students uh, in schools to oversee. So basically what we would propose with the looking into the governance uh, system here or a potential change, it would give your voice, your equal voice with the career center. You'd have a uh, voice with program approval, admissions, program design, curriculum, policy development implement and implementation, determining the, the center budget in detail in those program needs, recruitment and retention of qualified staff, marketing and recruitment for students, grades nine through 12, outreach across all sectors of this of our region. We would still continue to serve this, this region. Middle school career awareness for all sending regions is another big area that we would really like to um, spend more, some, more time and get into and maybe uh, divert some resources toward that as well. Establishing perhaps, perhaps board committees that could take on some focused charges and provide, um, allow for full decision-making authority as a board versus being in an, an advisory capacity as the regional advisory board is today. So um, I'd like to ask uh, Clifton and or Scott if they would like to chime in with anything they'd like to add to that before we opened for questions and answers on that particular topic. Uh, well, I'm, I have would like to add something if I may. So thank you very much for having us. Uh, so I'm Cliff Long, I teach plumbing and heating and I'm a former member of the Washington Village School Board and a former chair of the um, Orange North Supervisor Union Board before they merged with Northfield. And you know, to me, one, one of the things of great value in Vermont is the close connection between community and public education. I mean, to me, community and public education are inseparable in Vermont. So I feel like the fact that we're governed by Barry Board, by the Barry Board, kind of uh, denies us the full involvement of the other communities that we serve. So, so to me, it's this is absolutely worth some investigation. And you know, uh, I think that we have a lot to gain from a board's full involvement. And so, uh, you know, we we're a relatively small part of Barry, and they understandably, as they should, focus more on the pre-K-12 regular education system. So I think we would really value a dedicated board that where we could invite the members in, have them get to know us, get to know our teachers, our students, our curriculum. And, you know, board membership tends to change rather slowly, and that continuity is really valuable to the administration, to the teachers. So I feel like if I were in your position, I would definitely uh, you know, support this study. And then, you know, there are many questions to be answered that can be, if it's pursued. Thank you. This is uh, Scott speaking and, and Penny, I would know, you might not have noticed that Cal has joined us as well. So. Oh, great. Um, what is he? Yeah. Um, I would just mention it's, uh, this is going to age me a little bit, but it's my 23rd year. Um, in, in Barry and, and 20th at, um, at the Career Center. And um, I say that because I, I would say we've enjoyed the good graces of uh, Barry District all these years, um, but by the same token, it's clearly a stretch for them to, um, in all aspects of operation, to um, truly uh, understand us and, uh, and support us. So um, when we look at this opportunity as, uh, really, and, and the decision point tonight being really just, do you um, uh, think about this enough that it's worth, uh, worth the study, then I would, you know, I would strongly suggest it's worth the study. And to me, it's a plus that uh, Barry has already approved it and, um, and given some um, good thought into that. And not because they don't want to support us, but in fact, because they want to continue to support us in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an opportunity potentially in front of us. Uh, and I would suggest at least worth, uh, at least worth going forward with a study. Thank you, Scott. Cal, would you like to uh, chime in on this? 
Um, hey, everybody. My name is Cal Hopwood. I teach the second year digital media arts program and, um, you know, not much else to say. I guess I would I would just strongly suggest that you all um, consider the, the study here. Um, this is only my third year teaching full time here, so I'll kind of speak as the the new person. Um, but, you know, from from what I'm seeing in career and technical education, it's is uh, it's been very eye opening and <clears throat> Um, I think this process of being kind of, you know, governing ourselves would allow for more transparency with all the, the schools that mm -hmm. send students to us. So I think this would really just benefit everybody. Um, so hopefully you'll consider it. Thank you, Cal. Um, I think if we would, if you want to stay with this topic, we could move through this topic and then I could move into um, answering any questions around this topic, then into enrollment, the historical enrollment data that you received, which shows some really nice growth for Montpelier. I do have um, some post-secondary data for your on your students that I could share as well, and as well as some co-op um, work-based learning information, if that's of interest of this board. Would you like to continue with this particular topic before we move into something else? Um. I'm certainly interested. I, does anyone want to move into something Andrew, else or hear more? Andrew has his hand raised. Does he? Oh, hey, Andrew. Yeah, sorry. I need to put my. It's a, um, how, however, you want to do this is fine, but can you, as, as you move through this, can you contextualize uh, how this study fits into this larger process of moving? to a governance committee like what does that entire process look like and you might have sent that and i might have overlooked it in the materials and a, a general question that will probably get answered during that explanation is it other than us voting on this study committee would there be say 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 the districts wanted to proceed with this would the districts be voting again on on these issues you know like what is I just don't understand what the entire process looks like. I haven't, um, mm -hmm. I haven't given much thought to this, so thank you. <laughs> Surely, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the timeline component. Um, once the study committee is done, which is gonna be a relatively short period of time, about six weeks or so, six to eight weeks with one meeting a week. And we hope that by June and July, somewhere in that window that we would have the results of that study committee available to come back to the boards and inform the boards uh, where we are. The next step would be to move that on to Secretary uh, Dan French, if there's support from him to move forward and actually put that on the State Board of Education agenda, that could move into roughly September, October. Um, how long it stays on that agenda, depending on what they ask for additional questions would be another uh, piece with the State Board of Ed. Conceptually, if we were to move into our own governance model, it could be as, as late as FY23. It would take some time. So this is the first initial stages of just looking into and investigating this um, possibility for the Central Vermont Career Center. Is, uh, is I will say that... Uh, yeah, go ahead. So is this the only item in the process that this board would be? I'm just trying to figure out where our role is in this process. Um, so obviously, I understand with regard to the study committee, but I'm just thinking, you know, clearly, you guys have thought a lot about this. The study committee will be helpful to in, in, inform how you proceed with this. Um, but it seems like you're kind of on that track already. So I'm just wondering, you know, and, and I really don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, you know, what, what is our role in this, in this process moving through those different tiers? Clearly the Board of Education and Secretary of Education have a role as you've outlined it. Correct, they have the, the, the role to say whether or not we could actually put this in front of all 16 towns to vote. So there has to be a, a town vote on this uh, process as well. Your role right now is to, to um, 
hopefully grant us to move forward into the study committee process, appoint a, a board member who would be willing to be part of that process, who then could come back and inform you as you go and, and keep you in the loop there. And then our results would have to go back to our current governing board, which is the Barry Unified Union School District and the Regional Advisory Board. And in the Regional Advisory Board, you have Libby as a representative as well there. So you'll still get information as to where we are in the committee. The committee comes forward with a, with a positive proposal saying this is uh, something we should look at proposing as a change in a governance structure for Central Vermont Career Center to Secretary French. Then it goes into his hands and moves through his process along with the State Board of Education. If the State Board of Education decides that, yes, that's that's agreeable to them, this sounds like this would work for our, our center and our region, then we embark on the process of outreach and uh, communicating with all 16 towns and getting this onto a, a town vote to move into that new governance structure. So the process is quite involved, quite lengthy. Um, and the study itself is this, the smaller component at the beginning uh, to hopefully answer some questions. I did have a, a question from, a uh, couple of questions from the Washington Central Board wanting to know um, what is the impact of something like this on their school board? What might they expect? And is there a financial impact? And there isn't a financial impact, nor would the school board need to take on additional business. Hence, the new governing board would be the one to uh, take on the, the governing business of the Career Center, much like you do for the Montpelier-Roxbury district. And there is, there is no additional financial cost, only that you're, you're going to have a voice from this point forward or that point forward on um, what the Career Center offers and how it functions, and uh, which makes sense if we're going to be a, a regional um, career center. So that's the length of the timeline. I think it will clarify more for me as I get further into this process because I haven't gone through a process like this yet myself either. Thank you so much. And also, thank you, thank you for all the hard work you all are doing. I know a lot of a lot of kids and families and people who have um, really benefited from the career center. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for that. Uh, Emma. Yeah, I'll just echo the thanks and um, praise of the Career Center. Um, we're very lucky to have it as part of our community, and the students are very lucky to have that as an option. Um, to me, it looks like, you know, there's so much great thought and effort put into um, this proposal. And since there's already support from Barry and U32, I feel like, I mean, I'm still interested in hearing more, but I mean, mm -hmm. I'm ready to, to make a motion. I don't know if that's, if now is an appropriate time. I think for your board, it's it's fine. Everybody would love to do that. And we can continue the conversation and answer questions. Um, there are two actions. One would be to the motion to begin this, to join the study committee. And then the second would be to appoint a board member to represent your district on that committee. Do we feel we're ready for that or do you want to hear more from um, the presenters? Because we've got Amanda and Jill with their hands up. Um, Amanda? Yeah, um, I was uh, looking at the uh, enrollment, and again, you know, thank you so much. I uh, echo what everybody's praises of um, all of that you did and all of that you do. Um, but I'm curious about the enrollment. I, I was looking at the charts. Do you guys have uh, this integration of data in terms of race and ethnicity of who's attending from um, it, as, as a whole, uh, gender? Like, what kind of data are you collecting around demographics? We actually have all of that data in our state database. We enter that into the state database twice a year, in October and again in March. I don't have those reports at hand, but yes, we do have that. And we look at that frequently. We definitely look at gender. There's, um, there's a, a measure and benchmark that we're held to, all career centers are held to actually, uh, that's related to non-traditional participation where females are participating in a, in a typical male 
um, um, focused career path and vice versa. And we, some of our funding through Perkins is actually attached to that, improving those uh, percentages within the program. And we have a data team that focuses on this information as well. So we do have the ability to pull uh, that information. Um, so I'm glad you're asking that because not many people ask us that question. And uh, is, that, is that data that you can share with us that we can access or is that? Well, we can we could pull um, reports from that state database. I will say the state database is a bit antiquated. So what we do is pull that information into our own access database. And if you wanted to uh, send Libby or you could send it directly to me, but if you wanted to send her an email with the field that you're interested in, we'd be glad to pull that together for you. That would be great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. And with the with the check that the end size may be very small and so it, it may not be public data because it's very small end sizes that would be the only right. to that to that data does that mean that the school board members cannot uh, have access to data like that either it, it depends on what um the question is that we're answering just because we can't give identifiable identifiable data information to, to a yeah. public entity yeah for um for for the uh, and I'm not just asking for Montpelier, but for our Washington, like central. So it's like more than just our district. You mean Washington County? Washington County, yes. Oh, that that would be different. The inside would yeah. be much larger. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Jill. Thank you. Um, thank you all for the presentation. I'm excited to hear what comes out of this. Um, I am. Definitely ready to make a motion, Jim. Helpful to know, and, and I don't know if it's a foregone conclusion, but if we need a board member to volunteer to be on the study committee, I'm happy to do that, knowing that maybe someone else was already in mind. But, um, and I was just wondering um, to you folks, what what sort of criteria do you think the AOE and the state board will be looking for? Is it purely formality, or are they concerned, or are they sort of checking for financial stability? I'm just wondering what what what's what would be an example of an successful pitch Thank the you. last center that has gone through this was uh 2004 it's been a while so yeah so um i don't think that they're looking for anything in particular only that the districts are willing to have a start uh, look into this study committee and you know, I, I think as long as it looks to benefit students, it needs to be a benefit to our students. And far as I'm concerned, a, a broader, more equal voice across the region is a direct benefit for our students. Having a board that would be able to um, focus purely on CTE and the programming and the connections we need to have with industry and post-secondary, um, I think is a direct impact for students. So I, I think as long as um, we're able to show that that makes sense to make a move like that, that the, the board may be in support, that's the first leg actually, because the next one, the bigger one is the actual vote by the towns. And, and we'd go through that vote every year. It's quite a big undertaking. And I try not to think of how big it is <laughs> because I'd like to just continue these more uh, intimate conversations instead of trying to project so far out. But um, I don't think they have any preconceived notions about what they think this should or shouldn't be. Uh, they just wanna make sure that everybody has a voice and has been well informed and understands what this means. Right. Uh, Emma, is your hand up again, or did you just not take it down? I just forgot to lower it. Okay. Um, excellent. Are we at the point where we want to make a motion? Um, Um, sure. I, uh, I move to approve the Central Vermont Career Center request to establish a governance study committee to determine if a governance change is appropriate for the Central Vermont Career Center. Great. Do we have a second? Second. I second. Got a, had a tie there. Um, Anna, you can <laughs> choose. Uh, any discussion? Great. Uh, Jill. 
Aye. Emma? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Mia? Aye. Jerry? Aye. And Amanda? See. Si. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a question, actually, Jim, before we go on to the second yep. motion. Um, do we need, because the, we're going to be talking probably in the next month or so about another committee. Um, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself right now. Um, but do, would we be able to, do we have to appoint this person tonight? Um, is, is my question, because if we're going to be talking about some other committee things in the next month, I'm wondering if we might want to just save this appointment for then. Jill's excited, Andrew. I don't know. All right. Yeah. All right. Like, yeah, she was ready to go. The thing is, like, I know she's going to be excited coach. about another committee too. <laughs> 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 because a committee she was on uh, was suspended. Um, so. Oh. Let's leave that up to Jill. Jill? You want me to move ahead with the motion? Yeah, I'm not reading between the lines. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm confused as well. I don't, I don't I want to get too- fantastic on this committee, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, you'd be amazing, of course. You'd be, be great for Penny yeah. to have. Yeah, I, I think we should, uh, I think we should go <laughs> with an enthusiastic volunteer while we have one. Sounds good. <laughs> I move to elect Jill Remick. Um, to serve as the Montpelier Roxbury School District representative on the CVCC Governance Study Committee. Second. Uh, second. Second. I think that was Mia. Great. Um, any discussion? Uh, Jill. Aye, and thank you. Emma. Aye. Anakit. Aye. Uh, Ryan. Aye. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Mia? Aye. Jerry? Aye. And Amanda? Si. Yes. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for the presentation. This is great work you're doing, and we really appreciate um, taking time out of your evening to, to educate us more about this. Um, and we look forward to having uh, Jill serve and uh, be part of the process going forward. That's great, Jim, and the rest of the board. I appreciate uh, all of you participating in this process. If uh, I can make sure that your motion to approve us moving into the study is actually in your minutes, I'll be asking for a copy of those minutes as part of our, our record and our documents moving through this process. Um, it sounds like it all went smoothly and, and worked really well. Um, so. I don't know if anyone wants to ask any other questions about other topics or things that, that you're interested or curious about. Uh, we do have a re process that's moving forward. And tomorrow night we're hosting uh, many of our major employers in the region in a conversation about what programs should be at the center, what type of things that we might be able to consider in uh, changing in programs delivery, uh, how to best meet the needs of our employers and our post-secondary partners. So that's happening uh, tomorrow night, which is exciting. So all of this is kind of running side by side as we move forward into uh, re-envisioning the Career Center for our, our region. If there's other questions, I'd be glad. I've got a, a group of folks here who could help answer some questions if anyone is curious about any of that. Yeah, it like Amanda yeah. has a question. Um, I don't have a question. I guess more, well, yes, it's a question with a comment, I guess, because um, I think a lot about ra racial equity and um, just thinking about that there's a grow um, movement around BIPOC uh, businesses in the state. Um, there was a survey that was sent out by Diversity of Partnership Group, um, Curtis Reed, um, and, and I'm just wondering about partnership with BIPOC employers, as well as the offering a multilingual for our multilingual families that are coming in to, or that are in our state. Um, and so just like thinking about that, about resources around that and how. Um, 
that is in your re envisioning um, and how that is included around the racial equity. And uh, Susana Davis also, the racial equity director also came out with a uh, equity impact assessment tool that is really great to think about when we are building new policies and new governing structures that I can share with you, Penny. But uh, there's just oh, like that, that as, as a state, there's a it's just a move to be thinking about how we're incorporated equity in every level of our work and the push to support the BIPOC businesses that are um, sprouting right now is so important to give our students that are, um, you know, from different racial and ethnic backgrounds a space where they can feel at home as well when they are, you know, entering into into these career choices. So we we'll love to talk would... more about it too. So it, in any other time. That would, that would be wonderful. I think if you could give some of those resources to Jill and have her bring those to the table as well with our governance work, because that, you know, we're kind of going back and forth between these two groups, governance and re-envisioning. And, and I would appreciate um, those resources myself. And so I can bring that directly to the re-envisioning table and know that there are gonna be many, many more conversations about the Career Center and its future um, as we start to look at where are we gonna go within our region. We're so far right now from Harwood and Cabot and Twinfield, we're on the other side of our region. And we need to move somewhere centrally, which is obviously closer to where you folks are. Um, but in the process of looking at something as grand as a, of a move of the Career Center, just for access alone, um, we need to be looking at everything that encompasses an, a full service Career Center that has post-secondary industry and all the partners. Um, so it's a complex thing and we're just starting really in that process. So I would love to have any and all resources that you would like to share. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew has his hand up as well. Yeah, I, this is just like a 5,000 foot question. In terms of keeping abreast of developments at the Career Center, both in terms of this initiative, as well as the programming that you all work on and um, any events that you guys have, I know you guys have a calendar on your website, but are there any, are there any newsletters or social media handles that you'd suggest that members of the public or the board could follow or subscribe to, to stay abreast of these developments, events, initiatives, et cetera. Yes, and I'm gonna ask our media, media uh, direct, which is uh, Cal Hopwood, ask if he would like to chime in on that, on that question. Yeah, <clears throat> um, we do have a, a bit of a social media presence. Uh, we've been trying to bolster that as a, as a part of my second year media arts program, kind of allowing the students to take charge of that. And unfortunately, we were kind of very invested in that process. And with COVID and everything, it's been a little bit more difficult in terms of um, just having access towards other programs and, and getting all that information out there. However, if you if you look at our website, um, we have lots of new videos that are coming out. Actually, um, all new program videos for each one of our programs have been coming out and the last two, I believe, should be out this week. So if you look at our website, which is cvtcc.org, um, you'll be able to see all of our new content, but also we are the, Champlain, or, um, the, the Central Vermont Career Center on Instagram. And we have some posts that we do there and also on Facebook as well. If you look up the, the Central Vermont Career Center, you should be able to find us fairly easily. Those new videos are awesome. The ones that I've seen so far are so well done. Great, so thank I, you so I have much. to say, Libby, that the, the uh, rough cut footage that's created and all the photography is uh, through Cal's program, his oh, students. I don't, I don't doubt it. Cal, I don't know, I'll, I'm gonna sing your praises a little bit. I've never met you, however, nice to see you. Um, the, uh, <laughs> you. Two years ago, there was a student who spoke at our graduation when we could have graduation and she spoke all about 
what must have been your program. Um, and mm -hmm. she credited you and your program to to being who she was as a as a high school senior and a graduate. So you really uh, influenced this young lady quite a bit. And I believe she went into digital, digital media. So you're doing some good things over there. Great, well, thank you so much. I can't take all the credit. Matt, Matthew Bingeno teaches a first year program and he's phenomenal. So he sets the, sets the stage and foundation there. But thank you so much, Libby, appreciate that. Uh, in our line of work, you take credit where credit is due. So thank you so much for <laughs> 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 Thank you, Cal. Okay. Uh, other questions for Penny Scott, Cal, and No, thank you again. Um, Again, this is great work you're doing. We're very excited, and uh, uh, Jill will, will represent us moving forward. And we look forward to hearing more about how the process process goes, and how the what the study committee concludes, and what the next steps are. And I want to thank Michael Dewees for helping us with uh, our work so far, and willing to continue with us, which is a big, big help for us. And we look forward to. Uh, bringing some information back to you all and keeping you informed. Check out our websites and, and the connections that uh, Cal just mentioned. I wish you all the best and I hope you have a great break next week and we can start looking at uh, the end of this COVID pandemic year. It would be nice to see some sort of normalcy and everyone stay well, um, but feel free to re reach out to us anytime. And as soon as we're able to bring visitors in, we welcome folks to stop by and uh, see kids in action because the kids love talking about their work and showcasing their their work. So we would be really excited to do that when when the pandemic allows us to do that. Great, thank you. Yes, no, we we are looking forward in person as well. So thanks everyone. <laughs> thank, thank you. Have you a good evening. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, did you see Thank the you. comment in the chat? What? Yes, did I did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Listen, me encanta que hablen español ahí. Um, so before I move to policy, there are a couple of things I neglected to uh, add at the agenda. One is um, uh, with some help from Andrew uh, and a review by Olivia, I put together a letter to the governor that, that Anna sent around, I think yesterday, um, just expressing concern over the, uh, the move to go to full in-person in April and some of the concerns that we uh, talked about last time. Um, I just wanted to give some chance for feedback on that uh, before we, we send it. Um, folks have edits uh, or questions about it. Mia? <clears throat> Did we receive any clarification about what they mean by going to it in person? Um, I'm wondering if what we are, are what we've already put in place would qualify as in person. I'm going to say it does, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> I don't know if the secretary does. would say the same thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we don't have. So I guess that's a we don't have clarification by what they mean as in person. We don't. Okay. No. Okay. The reason I was asking the question is um, that. I, I, if, if what we're doing <laughs> meets the in-person standard, then I don't know how hard we need to advocate for them to not have the standard, knowing that there are um, districts doing all much different versions of school than we are, and that in some of those districts, they might benefit from the nudge. But, um, but since we don't have that clar clarity, um, and since what we are doing definitely works, um, yeah, then I, I guess that's I it. I think we can speak from MRPS perspective. 
right? This is this is our perspective. We're not yep. speaking for any other district. We're speaking for our district and what we've put in place and what we can and cannot do. Um, I think in, as long as we do that, um, it goes a long way for our educators uh, that the people in leadership who they're looking to to lead them are are speaking up for them and the good work they're doing. Yeah, and especially with the um, the combination of going to in person, whatever they mean by that, and not prioritizing teachers um, with vaccines. I, I yeah. would definitely yeah. second that. Yep. Yeah. Um, Amanda, Jill, you had your hand up and put it down. You question answered. Uh, Amanda? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the letter is. I, what, how can I say this? Um, I, I think it needs a little bit of a tweaking. So in the second, it doesn't seem like we're speaking for our district alone, but that we are speaking to so like the second paragraph of saying, for one, many districts have in-person systems that are effectively achieving. I would like to see more of showing who we are and what we're doing and say how effective we have been at it. I think more proactive and say, this is what's worked for us. Um, and it, it just, it seems to me what I, how I read is a little bit passive aggressive, to be honest with you. Um, so, but you know, I, it's, if you want to send it like that, that's fine. But like, I, I would, I would, I would highlight more of how much, how effective we have been and how great a uh, job the district has done, Levy and, you know, all the administrators. Uh, and that the, our concerns are based in that we have built a system that, you know, works and that has been proven effective in that. And then, you know, the hardship, what it means, which is in, in the last fire, because I, you know, I, I appreciate the, um, the vaccine piece for the educators. And I can, I can, after the meeting, send you track changes if that is helpful, but it, we could also just, I also won't not approve if that you want to just go with what you have. Um, okay, I mean, if others share those concerns, definitely happy to get a run at it. Um, I'm I'm okay either way. Emma? Yeah, as I'm reading over it, I am, um, I'm sort of thinking it might be, we might be better served or more effective by just speaking um, more directly, like Libby said, to our district, district. in those first um, four paragraphs, like just saying, we believe in what we've created and, and we don't want to change what we're doing this late into the year. And just being very clear and giving some exam, you, you've given a couple of examples, but just highlighting those and just being a little bit more like, direct to the point, you know, and not as not speaking broadly to other schools. Because I sense that maybe Mia might be right in terms of like, this could be a little bit of overkill for what they actually are talking about in terms of in person instruction. And so it may be that we are already offering that. And I think that we can just speak to what's working in our district and be a little more short and sweet, succinct about it. Well, I guess there's a question like, do we need it at all? I mean, if we feel, yeah, because when you wrote it, it sounded like there was going to be a harder call for in-person that would be difficult for many districts, including ours to comply with. Um, I go back to- I mean, I'm okay not, I'm okay, you know, not saying that if we feel we're in compliance and we don't need to raise the issue. I go Maybe. back to the larger issue. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jim. Um, I go back to the larger issue of um, it matters to our educators that you wrote this. And it will yeah. matter to our educators that you wrote this. Um, and it will, uh, it's, it's an added stress that I have told them that I will fight tooth and nails to not happen <laughs> um, because, because of the work they're doing. And so I think if their board, their school board, whether it's a political statement or not from the state piece, um, 
I think it goes a long way for, for the educators who are working hard for our students. So I would advocate you, you do write it or you do send it. Um, you can make, you could take that feedback and make it more specific to MRPS um, because that's the system we know, right? And we can't speak for other systems. Um, However, I, I think most educators in other systems probably feel the same way. <laughs> like, don't put extra stress on, our, on us. Um, but at the same time, we know MRPS. So you could take that feedback and put, we can work on some really specific pieces that MRPS has in place and some specific challenges um, to changing our system and with six weeks left to school, left for school. So, um, but yeah, I, th I think it matters to the educators at MRPS. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that was there. You're right. That was part of having it written. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I had two things I wanted to say. And one was exactly what Libby just said, which is we are an employer of a lot of talented people yeah. and a lot of talented people who are putting a lot of energy and, you know, they're, they're, they're putting, they're putting themselves in a very difficult position. Let's be real. And I think we, we need to advocate for them. Um, that's what we as a board, um, as an administration, you know, we are a major employer and we need to be a good employer. And that means, you know, going to bat at a higher policy level for, for them from time to time. So I think, I think it's important that we, we do write this, but at the same time, I really love the points that I've heard, you know, from Emma, Amanda, Mia, you know, from my perspective, and I think Libby has articulated this well in the past, MRPS can essentially serve as an example for the state on this. We have, um, we have achieved some excellent results. We do have pretty frequent comparatively um, in-person learning opportunities in our district. And I think we can actually serve as kind of, you know, maybe we don't know exactly what the governor meant by that statement, um, it was in his inaugural address. I, I don't believe there's been any clarity since then. Is that correct, Libby? And, um, you know, he's, he's, he's our state's leader on this issue. And I think some of it is visionary, what he's putting out there in an inaugural address. I'm certain some of it is. So, you know, maybe we help. I feel like we have an opportunity to say, you know, hey, hey Governor, we appreciate what you're saying. And we think that what we're doing could serve as a model for the state. That's... That's one approach. Jill? Yeah, I'll try to be quick because I don't want to be redundant. Um, I echo everything everyone said. I'm, I really appreciate you writing it. I have no edits. I think because we're writing it from a place of success and from, um, you know, here we are, we're coming up on February break, still going. Kids still going to school every day. Um, I, I think it's that much more powerful, frankly. Um, I think it's really unfortunate that they put a lot of districts in the position of even having to articulate that when this fall it was like, well, every diff district's different. So everyone gets to figure out their own. And I, I think frankly, um, what what Libby and her team created is a pretty elegant and frankly, I as a parent am finding it a pretty successful, um, incredibly successful um, structure for this year. So I think coming from that place to Andrew's point about being actually an example and also that being said, and also can we finish this year strong and supporting our teachers and not creating yet another wave of change at this point in the year? Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. And, um, and I, once again, think it's fantastic what we've accomplished this year. I totally agree. Um, so how do we want to go forward? I'm happy to give another round of changes, the acknowledgement that we probably wouldn't be able to set it off until after break in March. Um, I mean, if there's small changes we could, I don't want to draft right now, but um, I guess I guess either, um, either we can do another round of edits, people can, can redline it, uh, you know, send it on and we can look again at March 3rd or if we feel that it's generally there, I can make, a, I could add a little more, a few more examples, work with Libby on that, make a little more district specific and send it off, you know, the next few days. Well, have people had an opportunity to provide like 
comments other than just in this this setting right now because like Amanda said she would be happy to send along track changes I know Mia was really really helpful for from my perspective yeah. writing the op-ed uh for the budget um so that's I mean that's something I, that I, I, do. I think if it's tweaks like you know a few things here people can send that separately the problem is we can't we can't work on a Google Doc out of the session or becomes an unworn meeting. So if people feel there's kind of like tweaks they can provide, they can send them to me individually and I can incorporate it into a, a different letter um, and you know, add a few examples with Libby. If you know people feel it needs a major rewrite, then I feel we probably need to come back and discuss it as a group before we send it off. And I heard, I, I heard some people say largely okay with it, a few tweaks, like change the thing a bit. And I also heard maybe a, a larger rewrite was necessary. Amanda, your hands up. Yeah, for me, like I said, I think it needs changes, but I'm okay with just sending it as is. If it's the case of waiting until March, I'd rather just send it as is. Yeah. Ryan? Sure, I was just gonna say, I would offer a motion that we essentially appoint Jim as board chair authority to finish the letter based on the feedback that we've just had in this discussion. And when he as chair feels comfortable with that um, to submit it to the governor's office at that point in time, I think time was a bit important in this topic. We don't wanna send this out after we get back from March break and we're what, a few weeks away from that April deadline in a sense. Um, so I think we'd probably be better off just to kind of move along and allow Jim the uh, authority to kind of continue it and wrap it up. Uh, a second, uh, and then yeah, I just I just want to say I think I I think essentially there's two paragraphs early on that can that can just be kind of overhauled, and we could add some more examples and make it a little bit more MRPS specific. But I think the general thrust of it. Um, doesn't need to be changed very much. That's my two cents. And Jim, I, I'm happy to work with you and Libby, or if you're really tied up, I'm happy to spend a little bit of time this weekend um, on it. Yeah, I think we can likely get out Monday and appreciate that. Um, it was, did that count as a second? Yeah, so with that in mind, I, I second Ryan's motion. Uh, <laughs> Uh, any discussion? And I am not. Amanda, did you put your hand up again? Or is that from? Is that from last time? Same hand. Uh, discussion. Uh, Jill. Aye. Emma. Aye. Annika. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Mia. Aye. Amanda. Yes. Jerry. Aye. Great, thanks. And uh, yeah, I'll work on it this weekend. So you know, feel free to send send suggested edits beforehand, um, and uh, I'll try to incorporate as many as possible. And yeah, Andrew, I definitely will take you up on your offer to to help with that. So. Um, Great. I and the other matter I wanted to bring up, uh, which is super important, is uh, this is Ryan has sadly informed us that he is not going to seek um, another term. Um, and I just want to acknowledge his great service. And this is going to be, I believe, your last meeting. Um, so Ryan was uh, has been was on the Roxbury board for several years before uh, being a, a real leader in that community in terms of making the merger happen. Um, he served on the merger committee and very thoughtfully uh, led that community through that process um, and then uh, joined the, the newly formed uh, Montpelier Roxbury board uh, and has been a super thoughtful and super dedicated 
uh, board member um, uh, on this board. And I know he was, I you know, obviously wasn't serving with him on the Roxbury board, but I know he was for several years there as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge all your great work. Um, it's been fantastic working with him. I'm really gonna kind of miss having your, uh, your thoughtful voice uh, on the board, but I also uh, know you've put in your time as you as you said, uh, your wife your wife said she was no longer willing to vote for you. So that's that's probably the signal you need um, that that you've, you've done your time. But but uh, a huge thanks um, for all you've done, and uh, uh, we really appreciate the, the fantastic fantastic work uh, you've put in over over many years. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate all those kind words, and I think. I think it's probably public at this point in time in Roxbury as well, since the ballot is out there with no name on it. Um, <laughs> I could say at this point in time also that the person that had been kind of recruited to replace me has ended up not being able to do so. And next potential recruitment was going to be joining us this evening, which I'm not seeing in the audience list. So that might not be as promising as had been <laughs> hoped for. So Yes, any Roxburyans out there watching the meeting tonight, you know, please reach out. There's going to be an open spot on the board that I'm going to be looking for a great person to fill. And I know I truly, it's been, I saw my wife after dinner tonight coming down to the meeting. It's been eight years that I've been doing this board work. It's been a big part of my life. And I'm going to have to make sure that I find some good stuff to fill it up with so I don't have a big void. And, you know, like I truly hope that at some point in time, I've been able to make some contributions that have provided some good things for some of our students' lives. And, yeah, best of luck to all of you in your future work. And, and I'll come to the informational meeting just for the heck of it, right? So squeeze one more in before fully retire. Great. What'd you say, Ryan? I value your opinion too much and there's plenty of committees for you to join on to. <laughs> and I can say from the Roxbury side that he is very much appreciated in our community for all of the work he's done. It's and I mean, so so much dedication. So you've definitely done your time, Ryan. We really appreciate it. No, thank you. I appreciate everything. Yeah, and if you need any any help recruiting in Roxbury, I think we're all happy to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A couple more weeks for a writing candidate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure at this point, I hope it's not you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, great idea. Well, what was that? That's a great idea. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you again. And uh, yeah, you're, you're willing to join us, of course, anytime. And with Zoom, it's always easy to be in the audience, I know. Tina, Tina makes guest appearances relatively frequently. So, um, Jim, I've got a question. Yes. Uh, first of all, Ryan, thanks for uh, it's, it, thanks for serving all these years. I, I yeah, I've had, I haven't had a chance to work with you closely um, for as many, as much as I wanted, but um, thanks for all your service. Um, I've, my question is now that Ryan's leaving um, about committees. Um, on the negotiation uh, uh, side, do we do we uh, appoint somebody now? Do we appoint somebody after the uh, election, assuming somebody will replace Ryan? Uh, yeah, so we'll appoint. We have to actually reappoint everything on March third. We have to reorganize. Um, that will not be a huge task because. Uh, uh, I mean, the only real unknown is is Ryan's seat, uh, but you know we have three open positions and three uncontested races. So um, I'm guessing, given the early ballots out there, that Emma, Mia, and Amanda probably already have what they need to to get over the finish line. Um, so I so we will we'll reappoint. I think the big question will be Ryan, and if if yeah, we may not have we may have an open seat. Um, kind of depending on what happens with Roxbury, you know, it sounds like there's not someone currently on the ballot, so we may have to do do some outreach. So it may just be um, keeping keeping some vacancies. But I think on negotiations in particular, we would probably want 
to move someone um, onto that seat uh, on March 3rd, because that's- Anakit, Anakit, are you particularly worried about the, the negotiations that you and Ryan have been involved in? Yeah, especially Ryan's been yeah. leading that, so now um, with him you can, After your performance the other night, Anakin, you got, <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> Ryan, you would have been proud of him. It was it was spreadsheet wizardry. I'm always <laughs> always proud of him. <laughs> yeah, but we will we will find someone to help you, Anika. Um, yep. uh, you can. We don't have to do it now, but you, you may want to you may want to start privately lobbying folks. <laughs> um. All right, uh, policy monitor. We have the uh, prevention of harassment, hazing, and bullying, F20, and the F28 uh, Federal Child Nutrition Act uh, wellness policy. Um, do we have any, any question or discussion around those? I have a question. Yep. Um, so when we're monitoring the policy, we're just looking at what the policy is, just trying to understand. And uh, is there data that can support um, some of the policies that come with it? And um, what can the board access in terms of data around the haze and bullying harassment policy to look at what, what's working and what's not working? What data are you interested in? In bullying harassment and being desegregated by uh, disability and race and all of it, everything that you collect, basically, what can we have? So I, I think it, like, for me, it's important to be able to, you know, like be data driven to like, if we need to change a policy that's not working, how do I know if it's not working? And what kind of data backs it up? So in terms of the bullying harassment, for example, what kind of data are you collecting and what are we allowed to see or not see? So the HHB policy, they're pretty specific parameters as to when that type of investigation is initiated. Um, and so for instance, this year, we've probably initiated like three. Um, so they're, that's too small of a size to be able to bring to the board in terms of any, times of, any type of specific data. Um, and it's, and we don't have we don't have a significant amount of HHB investigations throughout a school year to be able to disaggregate it, disaggregate it by um, different, um, by special education or by, by racial ethnicity. It's just not big, a big enough number for us. We don't do that many investigations. And that policy is very specific as to when an investigation is started. Is there any, is there any way to look at like a 10 year, like what's, has happened in the district, just like to inform anything. And where does uh, that data go? Does that, that data go straight to the AOE? No, it doesn't go to the Agency of Education. Um, so so if, if the board, if the full board would like me to try to gather that, I can see what's available. I don't think we could get 10 years of data because our, it, I just don't know what kind of systems we had before my tenure as superintendent to collect it and keep it. Um, but I can see what we can gather if the board would like me to gather that kind of information. Uh, Mia? Um, I guess one of the questions for me is that this policy addresses like when we have when someone reports an incident we have to follow through on it but the policy doesn't address or or set any sort of benchmark for like pre prevention of it or or like any sort of way of measuring it uh um it, whether or not we're, we're being successful at limiting um, bullying or harassment from happening. So it just, to me, it makes me think we probably need a follow-up policy or an update. This is one of the ones that's mandated, right? From the state, mm -hmm. we have to have this. 
So maybe what we need is an, an additional policy that is like a following up on it. We have these values that we hold as a district. And so to, to follow through on those values, this is what we would like to see in, you know, in, in the district in terms of um, preventing harassment and bullying in the first place or something like that. You can add, the, the board can add to the policy, the language that's in this, but there's some policies that are written by lawyers um, and this is one of them. And yeah. so basically the VSBA will say, this is your policy. You can add to it, but you can't change it. Um, can't and, take anything out of it. Right, exactly, Yeah. exactly. So you could, the policy committee and the board could look at this policy and say, could we add to this policy for expectations around monitoring? Absolutely, that's your prerogative um, to do just what you were saying. But yeah, yeah. You, you can't change what the policy actually says because it was probably written by lawyers for the VSBA. Yep, okay. Um, Emma? Um, this policy has become a sort of topic of interest during the um, school safety and police relations committee work. And one of the main reasons is because in all of our surveying of stakeholders um, in that work that we did and that data that we collected, bullying was the number one concern among different stakeholder groups. Um, I think in particular guardians and community members. Um, and so that we've we heard several stories, you know, in some of that um, qualitative feedback around bullying and how it was handled or or not handled. Um, and so it does seem like a concern in our community, bullying in particular. And um, so I kind of agree, you know, I'm I my wheels are spinning a little bit as a member of the policy committee, <laughs> and now not having Ryan on that committee to help us uh, navigate these conversations. Um, but- yeah, You're it, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have, we'll have to recruit another person, right? <laughs> so in the implementation section of the actual policy, um, the language, you know, this is one of the things that kind of comes to mind um, in terms of what Amanda brought up too, was the, uh, I think it's number um, four under implementation, it says we will respond to notifications of possible violations of this policy um, in order to promptly and effectively address all complaints of hazing, harassment, or bullying. So I'm wondering, like, just in your analysis of whether we were in compliance, the word effective, that's the one that sort of pops out as, you know, what are what is our measure of success in terms of effectively handling, you know, a, a a bullying complaint um, from the time that it's filed to the time that it's resolved. From So from my perspective, here's one of the rubs for this policy is that a parent or a guardian will call something bullying that, that doesn't fit the definition according to the law. So the law is that somebody some, a child is targeted repeatedly over and over um, and that's what qualifies as bullying. And oftentimes what happens with parents that I've seen is that if their child is picked on um, at any point in time, um, that, the, that it's, called, it's named bullying. Um, and that very well could be true in, in the layman's term of what bullying means. But according to the law, that's not what bullying means. Um, it's the same kid picking on the same kid consistently over time um, that equals bullying. And that's a hard bar to prove. Harassment is actually easier to prove um, from a school what, system and from the definitions. What do we, so the language is just that it's repeated over time. Does it yeah, do with like an intent to ridicule something? Yeah. Or something. But so do two incidences count, you know, as being repeated or are you reading, I mean, what's the read on that? It depends on the situation. Like there's no one right answer to that, right? So I had a parent 
write to me the other day that said my kid has been bullied because she was pushed like they were at recess and she was pushed over at recess and and my kids bullying and they're not doing anything about it and it's like no that wouldn't even that wouldn't even start an investigation that's what happens on the playground sometimes you know so it's really tricky with this policy because of the definitions um and so if you if we really dug into the data based on the definitions of this law and this date and this policy that we're that is mandated there's not a lot of data to dig into we do investigate quite a few um, throughout the year but not a not as many as parents would like us to so that's one big challenge um if a kid is called a name that's not bullying necessarily but something um, that would fall under harassment right if it's targeted against a race, a religion, a sex, a, something like that, yes. That's what we, we investigate actually more harassment cases than we do bullying cases. So since this is like the bullying, harassment and hazing policy, yeah. when, when you went, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious uh, to Amanda's point about data, like if we could know how many cases of harassment are, um, how many complaints are filed of harassment and then how many of those cases are investigated and then how many of those, you know, what is our measure of success? Is there like a, some sort of process where the complainant like fills out a form and says, yes, I'm satisfied with the outcome or, or mm -hmm. how do we measure, you know? There's no, there's no like satisfaction. You, as a board, you could certainly put that into your policy that the superintendent will report out on the, on the number of um, HHB investigations that are conducted in a school year. Absolutely, you are more than welcome to, to add that to your policy. Again, you can add things to this policy, you just can't take anything out of this policy. Um, in terms of contentment of the outcome, it's, it's, it's a people's perception are their reality in this, in this situation, right? And so there's a couple of things that compete with that because of FERPA, we're not allowed to talk about consequences of other people's children, right? So I'll just use you as an example. If Soren picks on Fiona, right, and we find Soren guilty of har harassing Fiona, Jim's child, which I don't think he would do, but if, he, <laughs> if, if that were true, um, we couldn't tell Jim what consequences Soren had. So Jim will demand it. Jim, believe me, he will demand, demand it and say, I want to know what kind of discipline this child has. Um, but we wouldn't be able to tell him that because of FERPA rights. And so often parents are not satisfied with the outcome because we're not allowed to talk about the outcome with other yeah. people's children to them. So that would be a hard, that would be a hard burden of proof for us as a district for the board. Like, I, I don't know what kind of evidence I would bring in terms of satisfaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I'm just interested in the language that you used in your compliance report um, in terms of evidence. And a lot of it was just like, yes, we have these people in place and these systems in place. But I guess I, I was more interested in, you know, we've successfully and promptly and effectively resolved, you know, 80% of our cases or something like that. Yeah, then put that language into the policy. Yeah. And then the next year's policy monitoring will have that that inside of it. Absolutely. That's your prerogative as a policy committee and as a board. But so what was yeah. it? Is it sorry. More I'm sorry, I'll just say one more thing and then I could move on. But so was it more of like a qualitative, like a conversation with the equity coordinator around like, do you feel like we've effectively the so the language again in the in the policy is um, promptly and effectively addressed all complaints? Yeah, I would say we have because we're we're that is regulated for us. So if you look at the procedural document, when um, a, a legitimate complaint is made, then we have to immediately start certain steps. Does that make sense? Like, I mean, parents could sue us if we don't, right? So we we immediately start that, and that's what the procedure is there for. Um, and so so our view of effective may be a different definition of a parent's view of effective. Mia? I think Andrew might have actually had his hand up before me. Okay, you're, you're, you're on, 
Oh, really? Yeah. All right. I'll take it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, what's, what this is making me realize is that this policy feels like the floor and what we could be reaching for is a, is a higher standard um, of, if, you know, if, if we want to center that around the effectiveness of um, the, the uh, investigation or whatever, that seems good. And I think we could also um, look at what is it like, if, if bullying is a pretty high bar legally in this definition, then maybe we as a community, when we think about what are our values around the the social and emotional learning that bullying has a really detrimental effect on, like maybe we could be saying, yes, this is what the legal definition of bullying is. And in our community, while it doesn't necessarily trigger this like deep investigation, we do have a process that we follow when there is something like a push on the playground or two incidences instead of 12 or whatever. So anyway, this is the, that's the wheels that are turning in my head. And I, I, whatever process it is that we need to start to ask the, the policy committee to start to do that work, I'd like to, to start that. Cause I think it would start with the policy committee, right? Yeah, Which, it would definitely start with the policy. Has, has Amanda committee. and Emma now that Ryan is not. Uh, it would definitely start with the policy committee. Um, Andrew. So um, a couple of things. One is I, I think this conversation around, you know, what data are we collecting? Um, it, you know, how are we, how are we measuring success? Those, those types of discussions are really, really important. Um, I think something that we need to keep in mind too, I'm just adding this as one other just consideration um, that we need to keep in mind as a board. There's a, there's a lot of laws and a, and a lot of really yeah. great laws um, at the federal and state level that are in place to protect individuals' privacy and confidentiality. And we will bump into those because we have a small, we have, we have a, I, I was looking at the, the data even from central, from the Central Vermont Career Center and for Montpelier in certain programs, there's only one or two people and it would be very easy to identify people that way. So however we're doing this, we, we do need to keep in mind, you know, however we're measuring success, doing it in ways that we can collect meaningful data, but that won't, um, that, that won't come in conflict with those laws. That's something that we're gonna have to consider. And I think it's gonna be, um, you know, some of what you were proposing just before I'm, I think, I think would work, you know, um, so, but that's just something that I think we're gonna have to consider. And then the other thing is just the policy committee in general, this whole co conversation, I've been thinking about this lately, our policies when we merged as a district were completely overhauled. And the two main people who have worked on or who, who worked on the policy committee for the past, what, like three to five years, Jim, were Ryan and Bridget. They did most of the heavy lifting and they're gone. And yeah. we do need to have, the policy committee is a really, really important committee. And I do think we need three people on that committee. Um, so that's just something to think about heading into next month. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really important committee and it's one that has lost, you know, two people who were doing a very, very heavy lift for a long time. There was a lot, a lot of work being done. And frankly, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and we're talking about it right now. So, um, and we, this, this new configuration of the board hasn't really dealt with new policies because it, it it's an iterative process where the policy committee takes something provides something provides a justification for it and then board members will propose different ideas sometimes policies have come since i've been my short time on the board policies have come to us and the board says this isn't going to work for x y and z this isn't going to work and it goes you know back to the drawing board and then comes back again so this is it can be a very iterative process and um it's an important committee and these are important issues so Thanks, everyone. The other thing to consider with that, Andrew, is that policy should, policy should be written, rewritten or revisited every three yeah. years. Yep. And, yeah. And we're at that point. So next year, the policies will need to be re-voted on, I guess. Yeah. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big bulk of work that the board will need to do in the next school year. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, that should be something we, we definitely look at. Um, 
on March 3rd. Yeah, and I'll get you just a, just a second, Amanda. Um, yeah, is 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 uh, making sure we've got a, a good policy committee, Amanda. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, part of it is, I, I hear you, Andrea, around like the number of BIPOC folks that we have in our district and like, but there has to be a way for us to like think like, so is it, is it that Levy then takes that or like the district as a whole, like the staff is looking at that data because to be able to inform policy, like we need to really see what's happening right like so if uh let's say that if in literacy we don't we as a board don't know that bipoc students have lower rates and i'm just making this up than everything else how do we continue those conversations uh and how do we make policies if we don't know if if what we're using as desegregated data is like you can't look at it because of, of privacy but the district can look at it teachers are looking at it, principals are looking at it. So how do we inform our policies so that we're not blind by what's actually happening on the ground? So I think it's important because we know uh, that, you know, our rates for uh, people with disability, graduation rates for people with disability were not, you know, high. Like those are things that we should be informed around like the data that's happening in the district. I'm just making this up, you know, let's say that all BIPOC students were, you know, have the lower literacy rates and kids with disability, like suspension rates, all of that really makes us, like, it's important to look at the data because how do we get better at things if we don't know what the numbers are, right? So I think that we, it's not a yes or no, it's about like just dreaming about what procedures we can do to if we can look at it, then like, what are the ways that we can be informed um, and that it's attached to that equity policy that we have and it's attached with that, you know, this framework that we are really moving supporting BIPOC students, students with disabilities um, and students from the LGBTIQA community. So I think it's important for us to like, just like dream big about what we can get and not put like the blocks already. If we cannot get it, well, what are the ways around it? um that we look at that so i i think that i i want to just make a motion that you know, we look at this policy at, in the policy committee and like start uh thinking about questions mm -hmm. that we have and and whatnot and i agree all these policies from esda are the floor uh in their own words the floor and we can add a lot of things to it so here we are yeah, and I just I just want to clarify when I was talking about the numbers, I was talking about the Central Vermont Career Center and looking just within programs for Montpelier and some of those programs, you only have one student or two students. And if we receive data as a board in a public space about those students and there's only one student in this one program, we we probably can't receive information about one student in a public sphere like that that's it's it's probably going to be in violation of FERPA I have to imagine um so I mean yeah I I don't I don't want to get too far down this road right now but um it it's I under I hear what you're saying Amanda and I do think that there are ways that we can uh get meaningful information from the district but I don't think publicly sharing information about one or two students is going to be something that we're going to be able to do at any point. And that's definitely not what I'm asking, Andrew. I don't think that's what I'm asking around, you know, getting one student or two. I think that there are ways to do this, that we can look at the impact. It's an impact assessment, right? Like any policy that we do, we need to think about what are the impacts that it's going to have in marginalized communities or not. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's a strong desire for the policy. I don't think we need a motion on it. I think we can just set it on the policy committee's agenda for the policy committee to revisit this policy. I, I strongly suggest that that work be done in consultation with the VSBA, uh, which has legal services on this and uh, our district lawyers, uh, because um, I, I, I agree that we want as much data as we can to inform both the policy and then also kind of the reporting requirements of Libby. Um, 
but we do have to respect the rules because uh, not doing so would subject the district to potential enormous liability. So, um, but I, I, I don't think we can thread that needle. But let's let's make that kind of a top priority of the of the policy committee moving forward. Um, I think we had a motion. Well, let's let's make sure we had a motion to approve the the two policy reports. I don't think we ever got to the motion stage. Um, and are there questions on the Child Nutrition Act wellness policy? All right. So, a motion to approve uh, F twenty prevention of harassment, hazing, and bullying, and the uh, also the report on F-28, the Federal Child Nutrition Act Wellness Policy. Sorry, Jim, to approve what? The two policy monitoring reports. And what am I approving? That yeah, we're, we're just we're looking at it. Basic, we're just basically saying that, that Libby gave them to us and we received them and, and they're acceptable. Oh, but I would like to make to go and check the bullying and harassment policy and make changes. So is that approving this? And then it's just not, we're, we're, we're not we're not acting on the policy. We're just acting on the report. Like Libby, Libby is reporting on the existing policy. Okay. She's not so we're not. The discussion was that the existing policy needed revision, but we're not acting on the policy. We're just acting on her, re her monitoring report on the existing policy. So she's just telling us about compliance with existing policy. Oh, can you rephrase that then? So we're not with that we are approving the monitoring piece of it. Accepting. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm asking for a motion to do that from Jill. Do you want to make it? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. So I move that uh, we accept the submitted um, policy monitoring reports for, let's see, can we do them both together? Um, yes. For policy it's, uh, 20 and F28. I second. Uh, um, any discussion? Jill? Aye. Emma? Aye. Annika? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Mia? Aye. Uh, Amanda? Aye. And Jared? Aye. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we're on to superintendent evaluation and Libby, I think you can go enjoy your family. Uh, and now oh, do, do we need, do we need, a, we need a motion to go into the executive session? We need a motion to go to executive session. We also need, uh, Libby doesn't have to be around to do this unless she does. Uh, it, can Anna put us into, Anna put us into a breakout room that's not publicly accessible? I've already got you in breakout rooms. Jim, I'm going to make you the host. Okay. So you can. Um, Jim, do you know how to do that? Should we make somebody else the host? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> Emma. I mean, do, do you not have faith I, in No, me? but seriously. <laughs> Emma, do you want to be the host? Hey, I, I, teach, I teach with Zoom. I, I do breakout rooms all the time. I can definitely do it. Okay. okay. I, I cannot do it if I'm not the host, but. Um, no, I've already made the breakout room, but I'm going to move you to the host gym, and you may, I, I would yeah. assume the breakout room transfers to you, but if it doesn't, you may have to make okay, it. Okay, I will make it a breakout room, and, and I, I, I do not um, blame Andrew for his lack of faith in me. <laughs> that was just mean. <laughs> you also might want to make me or somebody co-host just best practice if you accidentally end the meeting every it will end for everybody unless there's a co-host i think anna is the co-host but um but oh, i didn't realize she was still on yeah, yeah. but jim now nah, i've i've given you my hosting duties so now you could make emma co-host if you want yeah 
It's a good idea, Jim. Has it, has, it, has it transferred? I'm not seeing. It's a good no, idea. I, okay, Jim. now I've got the breakout room function. Okay, cool. Hey, Jim, sorry, before we go, is uh, I sent an email around the waiting pupil study, and so that, that like, we can give just, like, a one-minute question that I have around that. Like, I don't know if you saw that email that I sent you. I did not see it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it, it, it's, I guess I just send an email to everybody then after. Um, yeah, if you want to ask it quickly. Um, well, there is a coalition of school boards um, in the state that is currently working on the wait and pupil study. And there, um, there's a bunch of meetings. There's a, they just hire a lobbying. So I, I you know, I, I'm part of their Google group just because I was kind of monitoring some for Act One. But um, so I, I don't know, like, I think that information is very interesting. Like lots of things are happening in the legislation that might, that are going to affect us. And if people are interested in, in I, I don't know how it will work, um, but I think it's really important that, that, that we are looking into that and I don't know who would like to do that. If anybody is interested in doing that, I think a lot of great things are happening. And I think eventually we will have to make decisions about, um, you know, whether we'll give testimony as a board or, or what uh, around what is happening and how that's gonna affect our district. And I think we should all be informed of what that means for us, so. And I, I yeah. did, um, send forward an email to Andrew around like that, that they just had a press conference and there's you know, all kinds of reports and testimonies from Secretary French and from all kinds of things that are, will impact us quite a lot actually, so. Yeah, no, and sorry, I'm just seeing that now. You've, it was a forward from Maggie Lim. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, Maybe we can add that as an agenda item on the third to talk about it and see who wants to monitor because it, it is going to have major impacts on the district um, and probably quite a bit on Montpelier because it will, uh, I think, greatly affect our, I mean, I think it's a fantastic thing for the state, um, but it may make some of our budgeting more difficult in the next couple of years because of the, the way that it's weighted right now, and and uh, we're in a, a we're a community that probably will lose pupils as a result. Right now, the model Before. they're suggesting that we'll lose six percent of our pupils of our equalized pupils. Um, and I know the legislature is talking about ways to make it um, come in over time, so it's not an immediate impact. But those legislative reports that you get from the VSBA um, and I get from the VSA are similar. They're the, they're pretty much the same kind of legislate, I think they write them together. So those are things to really pay attention to um, for the waiting study in particular. And, that, and that's like the equivalent of losing a grade. Yeah, it's big, it's, it's not small. <laughs> yeah. percent is big. It will, it will most definitely influence us. Yep, yeah, no, um, sorry I missed that email and thank you for bringing that up. No, let's, let's put that on the third and talk a little more deeply about how we wanna engage that process. Uh, all right, so I have breakout room authority. We now need a motion to um, go into breakout rooms. We don't need magic language for this. We just need a motion to move into executive session for the purpose of personnel evaluation. So moved. Uh, second? Second. Uh, Jill? Aye. Emma? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Uh, Le no, Le Ryan? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Mia? Aye. Amanda? Yes. And Jerry? Aye. Okay, let's see. So, do, so Libby and Anna can leave now? Is that right? Jim's the host. Yes. Got control. I'm the host. Well, we'll have to come back to adjourn for Anna's minutes, right? We'll just, yep. it, one of us will just email Anna to tell her, her when we do that. She does not need to stick around. <laughs>
Yeah. I'll email Anna. You got it, Jim? I got it. We have another co host, yeah. right? Huh? Okay. We, everybody obviously has total faith in you. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? Moved. Second. Second. Everyone just say aye, because I don't think anyone's going to. Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Aye. Y'all, thanks. <laughs> Bye. Good night. And Ryan, um, feel free to join us next time. But again, thanks so much for yeah. all you've done. Wish we could have you a proper or give you a proper in person send off. But um, okay. sad to see you go, Ryan. Yeah. Yes. Bye, Ryan. Yeah, all right. Good thanks, night. all. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you.